Aye. 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 Yeah, Aaron Carter, all tape. Excellent. Yep. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. Uh, there will be one additional item that I will add to the agenda as well. I just want to, uh, but we'll cover it off uh, later on. And that's just that I got a, uh, a text from uh, Frank Blum um, with regards to the wildlife park uh, uh, bee display out there. So uh, I'll bring that forward later. Um, Next item, uh, approval of the minutes. They were circulated. Rob had those uh, done up fairly promptly and they've been circulated. They've also been posted on our website. So if, again, if I can get a mover and a seconder, please. I'll move it. Thanks, appreciate that, Dave. Do I have a seconder, please? Dwayne? I'll second it, yeah. See Dwayne in the corner there. I've got about three people I can see. Thank you for that. All those in favor, again, audible, please. Yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. yes. Aye. yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. Thank you very much. Any opposed? Okay. Being none audible. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Moving into our uh, business, we will uh, have uh, Gary uh, do a quick introduction of our uh, educational presenter this evening, Dale Hill. He's already online and uh, looking forward to it. I'm going to drop off sharing here so that we can have a full screen and I'll allow uh, Gary to do a quick introduction here. Can anyone hear me? Very well. Okay, good. Got my speaker on. Like, uh, welcome, welcome, Dr. Hill, to our meeting. Thank you. He, he brings a lifetime of knowledge on animal nutrition, if I understand that correctly. Correct. And uh, I was fortunate enough to... Uh, oh, we got, oh, I got extra noise in the background. Need it? Need it? Okay. I'll, I'll try and talk over this so we don't Joe, get going. Joe and, Mar Joe and Marg's not muted. <laughs> Marg, how do you fix this? Just mute it, Joe, that's all. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'll start it again here. I was fortunate enough to introduce some of this when I was taking courses at the University of Montana. And I believe Dr. Hill will help us understand it's, it's a fairly complex topic, nutrition, but he has a nice way of explaining how that affects the bees, their life cycle through the seasons. And with that, that's enough of me and I'll let him proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Uh, let me get over here to share my screen and I need to pull up Is that better <clears throat> okay does that show up on your screen nope oh. okay let me says my internet connection is a little bit unstable, so we'll, we'll see what I can do here. There, we got it. Okay. We get up here. Is that full screen for everybody? Or is that close enough? Close enough. Yeah, I think we can work off of that. Your, uh, your slide deck is showing on the side yet, but that's fine. I think okay, let's we'll see it. what I can do here, whether that will take care of that. There we go. Yeah, okay. there we go. As Gary said, my background is animal nutrition, uh, a PhD in animal nutrition. I'm not an entomologist. Uh, when I work with bees, I, I do that as I do with any other ag species, um, try to maximize production and make sure that uh, all the ingredients that we use uh, meet a specific need of the animal and that uh, it provides an economic return to the producer. So that's, that's the approach that I take when I, I, I do bee work. Um, I got into honeybees when I was working with ADM before I retired about five years ago. And I ended up with, because I was ma working mainly on the vitamin trace mineral side on pet food nutrition, uh, if it was not traditional meat, milk and eggs, uh, I ended up with those projects and that's how kind of how I got into 
honeybees is because uh, Gabe Daydant uh, asked me to put some a protein supplement together. So after a considerable amount of, of digging into the, the, the uh, scientific literature and, and helping rewrite the, or actually completely rewriting the chapter in the hive and the honeybee on honeybee nutrition, uh, he asked me to put together a protein supplement. And fortunately with ADM, I had access to about 450 ingredients, but I developed a, a product that is sold for or by Daydant as AP23. And it happened to be the formula that I tested uh, with the bees before I, I finally feel that I got it right. I, uh, one of the big challenges is you can put together a lot of products that they will meet their nutritional needs, but they won't consume it. And if they don't consume it, it doesn't really doesn't do them much good. So that's kind of how I got into it. Uh, I'm not, I don't have bees right now because uh, last year I ended up having to have um, rotator cuff repair on my right shoulder. And, you know, they, they say there's two, ki two kinds of beekeepers, those with bad backs and those are going to get bad backs. And I happen to be one of them that uh, had the shoulder injury instead. But I want to cover tonight uh, specifically uh, winter feeding um, and preparing the, the bees for winter. And so some of the things we're going to cover is uh, the queen egg laying in fall and winter and feeding the bees in the fall and winter and how much protein, how much sucrose, uh, how much food stores are needed. And I wanna make sure that you understand the difference between a starve out and a freeze out. So if you go into your bees and you've lost that colony, you know uh, a little bit more about the reason that they died out and uh, how to prevent it for the next time. Uh, wanna talk a little bit about protecting hives from the weather and some of what I've done for hive insulation and uh, winter ventilation. And even up in your area, I think the winter ventilation is extremely important. We know that the worker bees have a, a summer lifespan of five to eight weeks on the average. Uh, they fly about 37,000, 38,000 miles, and, and they die actually because their wings wear out. On the other hand, the winter lifespan is four to five months or maybe even longer in the northern climates. Uh, so it's important to have a very strong mm -hmm. colony in the fall. Uh, one of the ways to do this is to restrict the entrance openings to minimize robbing of the weak hives and uh, to mouse proof the entrances. So that's some of the things that, that I recommend. But then keep in mind that bees don't hibernate. They really form a cluster to keep warm in, in the wintertime. And so the inside hive temperature is always kept about 95. 95, 90, 94, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 35 Celsius when the brood is present. When there's no brood present in the winter months, when the queen stops laying in, in uh, usually in late October, early November, for probably for your area, that is when the temperature drops, the outside temperature drops considerably below, you know, down around freezing or, or well below that they maintain that colony at about 75 degrees Fahrenheit or about 24 degrees Celsius when the, after the queen stops laying. And as soon as that queen starts laying in the spring, I should say late winter, early spring, then they kick that uh, hive temperature up to that 94, 95 degrees. Now bees generally don't leave the hive when the temperature is around 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 to 12 degrees Celsius but I have seen cleansing flights occur in the uh, low 40s, which is four to five degrees Celsius. Uh, honey bees are not aggressive by nature, we know that, but they will defend their hives. So when you open up these hives and check them in the winter time, uh, you do wanna wear at least a veil as a minimum. Uh, I'm happy to say that I have been stung every month of the year, but I wear a, uh, a suit every time I go out to check them. Uh, because they're not real happy campers when you open that hive when it's uh, down around freezing or a little bit below when you're checking for the food stores. So for northern U.S. and most of Canada, uh, if you go with what Marla Spivak out of the University of Minnesota recommends, it's going to take roughly 100 pounds of honey or about 45 kilos of honey for the average winter survival, probably even more uh, than that in severe winters. 
So it's that means it's going to be two very full deep boxes plus winter feeding or and or an extra super or even an extra deep. Uh, I tended to provide supplemental feeding. That is, uh, you can go with either little or no protein, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But primarily sucrose or table sugar is what is needed for energy during the winter. And in the fall, this time of year, uh, starting in late August through early to mid-September, depending on the weather, uh, the traditional recommendation is a two to one sucrose to water feeding, a syrup feeding. And that timing really is, is uh, weather dependent and what you have for food stores. And, and we all know that liquid feeding is, is fine until frost hits. And once the frost is there, it's very difficult to uh, uh, do the syrup feeding unless you're feeding inside the hives. And the other thing that I've needed to do from time to time is to, if the uh, bees have filled up the upper box, uh, and the lower box at this time of year is not completely full, I will switch to top and bottom boxes. That is because they, they tend to work the upper box more than they do the bottom boxes. And this way they have a, a full bottom box and they will, will fill up that partial empty top box that used to be on the bottom. So that's another uh, way to get more honey stores for them for the winter. You need about two full frames or roughly 500 to 600 square inches of pollen stores. And that is an aggregate across all frames, not just the, you, there's no way that you're going to get two full frames side by side. And this is two full frames out of say 20 if in a traditional uh, 10 frame deep. So if it's less than this, you wanna consider providing patties with 15 to 18% protein. And the rule of thumb is that most of the pollen supplements on the market uh, are in that 40 to 45% range for crude protein, uh, if you read the labels. And so if you're looking for 15 to 18% protein, that's four parts uh, pollen supplement or protein supplement, um, pollen uh, substitute, whatever you want to call it and six parts of sugar. And you add enough water in that to make it kind of a uh, uh, peanut butter consistency. And what I do is, is what we call Krabby Patties. And, and I, as best I can tell, this came from uh, the cartoon series, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, because that's, that's the only place that they call stuff like Krabby Patties. And so for that 15 to 18% uh, protein, I'll, I will use 30 to 40% of the pollen sub powder and 60 to 70% sucrose, and then enough water to hold this together again in, in kind of a peanut butter consistency, just so it doesn't fall out of the Ziploc bag. And again, I put this into a, this whole blend into a Ziploc bag. And I use my wife's uh, KitchenAid blender to do this so I can make up about four and a half to five pounds at a time. And she's, she's nice enough to let me do that. And, and if she's really nice, she'll help me clean up the mess afterwards. Uh, and then if, when the queen stops laying, that is in that uh, early to mid-November timeframe, when, when the queen stops oh. laying and the need is for uh, energy Hello. rather than protein. Hi. Hello, Zachary. Then we need to change to about a 10% pollen sub and 90% sucrose. I'm on a conference call right now. And so um, one of the main reasons to drop that protein down to about a 4 to 5% rather than the 30 to 40% is that if you feed too much uh, protein in the winter when the bees can't make cleansing flights, it significantly increases their susceptibility to nosema. Um, if they get a lot of protein in the gut uh, and there's a lot of undigested protein, that's great for the bacteria in the gut. But if they can't get rid of that through cleansing flights, uh, then it's very detrimental and, and creates the conditions. So kind of keep that in mind. If, if you've got uh, adequate pollen stores, uh, you can go to straight sucrose for winter feeding. If you don't have the, enough pollen stores, then change to that 10% uh, 
pollen subpowder and, and 90% sucrose. Now sucrose is, is basically, well, for all practical purposes, uh, table sugar. And from the bees standpoint, uh, it does not make any difference whether it's cane sugar or whether it is uh, beet sugar. Um, if you are so inclined to stay uh, organic, then you want to use the uh, cane sugar rather than the beet sugar because beets are uh, GMO. They are genetic, genetically modified. But from the, the quite realistically though, uh, the sucrose that you find for table sugar is refined to such an extent that there's there's really no protein there and it'd be very, very difficult to determine whether it is cane sugar or whether it is um, beet sugar. Now, we're talking white table sugar. We're not talking uh, brown sugar. Uh, I do not like, I don't like to feed brown sugar uh, anytime that the bees cannot make a, a cleansing flight because there's enough impurities left over in the processing that uh, the bees really need to be able to make those cleansing flights if you're feeding uh, brown sugar. And really the, the brown sugar, in, at least in my area, is, is actually more expensive than the white uh, table sugar. So kind of keep that in mind. This is what, this is what I call the Krabby Patty and it's a one gallon Ziploc bag. And let me see if I can get a, set up a pointer here. Okay, so it's about four and a half pounds fits very nicely into this. Um, I put two wooden sticks in here. It's, they're just three quarter inch by three quarter inch by three to four inches. And the primary purpose of that is to keep the uh, bag from collapsing on the bees. So what you're going to do is cut uh, a square or rectangle in between these two pieces of wood and then lay this side of it down. So these are on the frames, on the tops of the frames and it, it covers, you have at least two spaces between the frames where the bees can get to it. And the reason for doing that is, again, the bees will work up as they um, consume the food during the winter. And this way they can get into this baggie uh, really without uh, significant breaking of the cluster. And I think that's the important part. That's why I like this. And it's real simple to change these in the wintertime if you run out. I've had some of these uh, Krabby Patties last all winter. I've had other hives that uh, this has lasted maybe a month. And then I, I go through and check the hives about once a month, hopefully find a day, a day when it's halfway close to uh, freezing. And, and by doing it this way and having that patty ready to go if you need it, you can be in and out of those hives in, in uh, less than 10, 10 to 12 seconds. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy, pretty fast, pretty quick to do it this way. So that's, that's why I like it. I prefer this. That and it, it keeps things real clean inside the hive. So again, the, the queen will, will the, the egg laying of the queen declines in late fall. It stops in early winter as the daylight hours shorten and the temperature start or the hive temperature will drop to about 75 degrees. It may be uh, mid-October, maybe mid-November, depending upon your local weather conditions. The colony clusters uh, to stay warm and to maintain that hive temperature. And again, the bee clusters always move up to the food source. Uh, it's very seldom that I've seen them move down. I've had uh, colonies where uh, they've actually starved out and froze out, but the, uh, they've got plenty of food sources in the hive, just one or two frames over or down below where the, the bees are at. So they will always move up rather than down when they're in the cluster. So this is an infrared picture of a traditional uh, Langstroth hive, uh, not a very good pointer here. There we go. Uh, this area up here, this, this lighter color is the heat, the warmer area the, of the hive. This is where the bees are at. Uh, this was taken in uh, early January, a couple of years ago. And as you can see, the, the lower part of the, uh, the, the hive is very cool. 
and the upper part where the bees are clustered is uh, considerably warmer. And so this is why I always would, and, and this, uh, this is a friend of mine's hive. He, I use quilt boxes, he does not, uh, but the, the quilt box or a spacer is what I use here on just above the uh, upper box to give them room to uh, get into that Krabby Patty. So I thought I, well, yeah, I, I thought I had a break the picture there. But as daylight starts to get longer in the late winter and the queen starts to lay eggs again, uh, this may be uh, mid-February to mid-March, again, depending upon your local weather, local temperatures. When this happens, the, the, as soon as that queen starts laying eggs, uh, those bees will increase that temperature to 94, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, they're around 35 degrees Celsius. When this happens, there is a tremendous increase in the need for calories. And much of that is in the form of honey and supplemental feeding is sucrose. And if it's not there and they can't maintain that higher temperature, uh, the larvae will not survive, the eggs and larvae will not survive. Um, but they run out of, if they're gonna run out of groceries, this is when it's gonna happen. Uh, and that's, that's, usually it's a starve out if you don't have enough groceries for them at this time. Uh, so again, this is the time when you need, really need to be checking those hives and make sure they've got uh, supplemental feed for winter. I start feeding mine uh, uh, usually in early November, and I try to try to keep a, uh, a, a full Krabby Patty on all the hives all the time. I've had good success doing that. And again, some of those hives will go through that in a month. Others, it'll last all winter. So you really have to check them about once a month. Uh, and again, you can be in and out of those hives in, in 20 to, well, I should say 10 to 15 seconds is what I usually took to even with a change. If you don't have to change it, you can be in and out of that hive in, in say four to five seconds, just a real quick look and that's it. This is what a starve out looks like. All you're gonna see is bee butts. Uh, they have their heads in the cells trying to get every bit of honey that they can get to. Um, this is a very typical uh, picture which, that you see with a starve out. Uh, that happened to me my first winter with bees, and I decided that that was not going to happen to me again. So that's a lot of the reason I really push for supplemental feeding. Uh, again, don't let this happen to your bees. It's easy to, to provide the supplemental feeding. Again, it's depending upon pollen stores. Uh, you, you may want to provide a, some supplemental pollen uh, or protein, I should say. Uh, or if you've got plenty of pollen sores in the hive, uh, you can go with straight sucrose. A freeze out is, is when you have some warm weather for a short time period and the bees will break the cluster. And then that's followed by a rapid change to cold weather and the bees don't recluster fast enough to stay warm and survive. And when that happens, this is the more traditional picture or the more typical picture that you will see. There will be some bees head first in the cells that you can see through here, but these bees have basically broken cluster uh, and not been able to recluster fast enough to uh, maintain that hive temperature. Oftentimes, because of that, you'll see some white mold in the, uh, in the frames and on the wax. So this is, again, this is, there is a difference between the freeze out and the, and the starve out. And I think it's important to really understand the difference in what you're looking for or what you're looking at and the reasons for that. Okay, I wrap my hives with aluminum bubble wrap insulation and then heavy plastic on top of that. Uh, I only wrap the sides, not the top or the bottom. Uh, when you do that, so if you use, if you use metal, uh, like the aluminum, then you can't use the infrared camera to check your bees. Uh, so there's, 
if you want to use foam insulation, styrofoam insulation, uh, that would be another way to do that. And, and that way, if, if you do have access to a uh, infrared camera, you can still check your bees that way. The, uh, even the, those that use the one to two inch styrofoam we, will usually do that just on the four sides. Uh, I know some people will just use the roofing tar paper, um, which works well. The, the main thing is, is, is just like for us, uh, to cut that wind and, and really maintain that because um, you, your biggest heat loss is going to be through the, the wind. Uh, I use solid bottom boards in the wintertime. I use screen bottom boards in the summers. Uh, I know that some will use screen bottom boards. If you go further south, uh, some will, will use screen bottom boards all year round. Uh, many of us in, in our areas here in the upper, upper Midwest and upper Midwest that use the screen bottoms will, will use the uh, inserts. Some people will insulate the tops because there is a lot of, of uh, heat loss there. Uh, I did not. I used what we call quilt boxes. And if you're interested in making the quilt box, uh, that's the website you need to go to if you want to make your own. I just used a one by six um, and made a box the same size as what the uh, deep boxes were. And that's what it looked like. Um, I drilled, I'll show you the bottom. Well, let me go down. This is what the bottom looks like. I come up about two and a half inches, put a brace across there. Uh, you could either use, I used burlap because it was relatively inexpensive and readily available. You could also use window screen. And then I put uh, wood chips on top of that. But before I did that, I drilled holes, one inch holes. There's two on each side and I covered those with screen so the, the wood chips would stay in there. And then I made sure that the, these holes were, were uh, above the level of the uh, burlap or screen, whatever you're using. But it, when you put your top cover on, uh, don't block these holes because you need to have that, that ventilation. So with these, the, the moisture in the hives would be able, to, with the warm air, would be able to rise. Uh, the, the wood chips act uh, very well as insulation for the upper part of that hive, but the moisture would come up into those uh, wood chips. And if you had some real dry days, the, the moisture would actually evaporate and could go back into the, to the lower part of the hive or if there was enough airflow through the hive, it would actually go outside the hive. My first year when I, before I started using these, uh, I actually could see uh, moisture damage or moisture stains inside the hives from the excess moisture and actually had mold growing inside the hives. Once I started using these quilt boxes, uh, there was no more mold or, or water dampness uh, indications inside the hive boxes where the bees were at. But oftentimes I would find mold growing up here in the, uh, the wood chips. And this is just the, usually just the pine chips like is used for livestock bedding. And uh, come springtime, I'd, I'd put those all in a bucket, let them dry, and that's what I'd use in the smoker. Uh, that did create a little of extra tar in the uh, smoker, but uh, I would clean that out and that, that thing tended to work pretty well. Then the next fall, I would use uh, fresh wood chips. Also be a little bit careful because uh, when you store these in the summertime is that uh, the mice like to get in there and they uh, like that as a, a nice warm home for them. So again, with, with the space down here, that leaves me room to put my Krabby Patty on, right on top of the frames. Can I ask a question, Dale? Yes. Do you change the wood chips over the course of the winter? No, I don't. I haven't had to that you would even when you open that up, uh, you can check that, but I've not had a, enough of a moisture problem. You know, you could see s some slight mold growth. You could tell a few of them on the outside around the outer edges were a little bit damp. Uh, but what I usually did is, is if I saw that, I just put my hand in there, kind of stirred them up, stirred them around you know, so that there was uh, a good blend of dry chips all the way around again. 
But no, I, I typically did not have to replace those wood chips in the winter. If you have an, a lot of excess moisture, uh, you may need to do that, but I did not have to do that in, in mine. That answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Yep, thanks very much. Okay. The, the other thing about this is, is you need some type of windbreak. That, that's what I mentioned before with the part of the reason for the wrapping. And I wrapped mine because I did not have uh, a good windbreak where my hives were located. So you can use trees, uh, that's pretty common. Buildings, uh, on the south side of buildings, on the, the uh, away from pre uh, Some people use pallets uh, with tarps. Others use straight straw bales or hay bales. Uh, be a little bit careful with that because it's also a great place for the mice to hide for the winter. And uh, those people that I've talked to that did that uh, they have to make sure that they use uh, mouse guards on, the, on their entrances. Okay, it's high, uh, again, hive location. I wrap my hives since I didn't have uh, a good windbreak. Uh, again, protect the hives from prevailing winter winds and snow as best you can. Uh, make sure that you maintain ventilation holes. Uh, and, and I made sure that, that uh, the small opening that you have uh, typically with the, uh, the boards on the bottom, the entrance boards, uh, made sure that that was stayed clear of, of snow, um, but keep any openings mouse proof. Um, some of the guys would put these inside buildings. Uh, a lean to or pole barn is great uh, to get the bees out of the winter. I do recommend that if you do that, you put them towards the front of the building so the, the, the bees will still get, the, the hives that is, will still get the sunlight. Uh, I put bees further back in, in a pole barn and they did not survive. The ones that were out near the front, uh, just out of the weather, but could still get the sunlight. Uh, I had reasonably good luck with those surviving. And I think that just helps to, to warm them up when the, with the uh, low sun angle. Uh, as we know, the, the, uh, uh, particularly the, the later in the fall, uh, the darker the honey, uh, some of those black ones are very likely uh, uh, goldenrod. Uh, and I don't know about you guys, but some people like the goldenrod honey. I, I prefer the goldenrod honey that to, uh, to leave that for the bees because to me it, it smells like kind of sweat, like sweaty wets, dirty wets. Try again, dirty sweat socks. It has a very strong odor to it. Uh, I prefer to, to leave that for the bees rather than uh, consume it. But I, I just wanted to show you how dark sometimes the, the honeys can, can get. Uh, this, was, this was when I had bees in, in my previous location in Quincy, Illinois, uh, West Central Illinois. Uh, we just had 10 inches of new snow. Uh, I went out to check the hive openings to make sure I got ventilation through the, the, the hive openings uh, down in, in here, made sure that front porch was clear. Uh, made sure that the openings on the, the uh, quilt boxes were not covered, uh, but I got plenty of insulation here on, with the snow on the, on the tops of the hives. If you were using a uh, screen bottom, uh, you'd have some insulation around that, but that's, that was uh, a pretty heavy snow and, and I didn't lose any bees that winter, but you, you can see how I've got the, the hives wrapped uh, the aluminum uh, bubble wrap is on here, and then I've got the, the black plastic tape to that, and then I've got them that tied on with twine. And it, uh, it worked, it actually worked better than I expected it to. Uh, what some of the other people in, in the West Central Illinois area have done is gone to the horizontal hives, and this is a double deck horizontal hive. Um, what they did was take uh, pipe straps and connected two deep frames 
And so they just have one, they, they cut the, the ears off of the, the bottom frame so it would hang down into the, the hive and just had the uh, ears on the top um, for the hanging side of it. Uh, I don't have a picture of this being open, but it's, uh, the, the one thing about this is, is the guy that built these was able to put uh, inch and a half of, of styrofoam insulation all the way around. Uh, both on all the sides, on the bottom, and on the top. So um, he said he hardly went through any uh, any significant uh, honey stores during the winter compared to the Langstroth hives. Um, he also said that the, the bees will move back and forth from left to right. Uh, they'll move horizontal instead of just vertical. So it, in some areas, um, this might be something to consider. Uh, again, uh, you can do quite a bit of, of insulation when you build these things. The downside is this is not a movable hive, not, not portable. It's typically about 250 pounds, 300 pounds. Uh, the frames are movable. Uh, colony expansion is, is sideways, as I've said. This is much more common in Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, there is less food consumption with the greater insulation. But again, with, even with this type of hive, the ventilation is extremely important because you will get condensation uh, inside even because the, the condensation comes from normal metabolism of sugars. And, or, and just as, as we uh, breathe uh, the, the carbon dioxide and the water that come out in our breath, and it's the same situation with the bees. And you, so you have to have the, the ventilation to get that moisture out of there. Uh, this is that same hive and at night. Uh, you can see that the, the ambient temperature is minus 13 Celsius when I took this picture. Uh, you can see that the bee, bees are pretty well clustered in this area, but throughout this, this whole hive is you don't see the dark spots like you did with that infrared picture of the Langstroth hive. Uh, the bees are spread out quite a bit more. And, and basically what you're doing is all of your, your uh, frames are going to be on here on, on one side and you come over to about here and you have a partition that you can put down, a solid partition so you can kind of block this off and have any extra frames that you, you may need for later over here. Or if they're empty frames, you can put them on this side and, and move that portable uh, uh, it's, it's basically a quarter inch piece of plywood that you've got in there to, to close this off. So you can actually, uh, as if the bees are, are, have empty frames, you can move those over to this side and actually close down the space so the bees are having to keep less area warm. But even here with, with the way this is, you can see that these openings, uh, and he actually had the, the openings on the opposite side where he had his ventilation hole. So the, the airflow was from here going up to here, but you can see how much heat is still coming out of the ventilation holes. He had this one closed off, but it, it, it kind of gives you a good idea of, of how well insulated these are and, and uh, how we, they're, they're not portable, but they, uh, they do help with survival. If, and that may be an option if, if you've got the, uh, minus 30, minus 40 Celsius degrees, it may be something that you guys up there want to consider. Okay, for supplemental uh, feeding, in, in the early spring before the pollen flow, uh, one to one uh, sugar to sucrose or sucrose to water is recommended. And we do that to really encourage wax buildup uh, for the egg laying and for the food storage. Now, when we talk about a one-to-one -one ratio and a two-to-one ratio, keep in mind that, that this, these recommendations were developed back in the 1840s and 1850s. And I doubt that those folks back then had the, the uh, sophisticated equipment to measure, to weigh stuff like we do today. So, um, and, and I don't think it makes any difference if it's a one-to-one sugar to water or with it's a 1.2 to one sugar to water. Uh, this is bathtub chemistry. This is not uh, lab chemistry. As long as you're in the ballpark, uh, you're good. 
Um, I don't know whether you guys have access to high fructose corn syrup, but that's also something that you can use up there. Usually that it's more of the commercial guys that use the high fructose corn syrup. And that is fructose and glucose, the same simple sugars that make up sucrose. So whichever one you have access to, um, you can use. The, the thing about the high fructose corn syrup is that you wanna make sure that it is uh, fresh from the manufacturer uh, and it is a very light, almost clear color. If it starts to turn yellow or a brownish color or a brownish tinge to it, I would not use it because it, as a natural degradation product of high fructose corn syrup, you get a compound that's called hydroxymethylferferol and that hydroxymethylferferol is toxic to the bees. They cannot metabolize it. So um, for most of us as hobby beekeepers, uh, we're much further ahead to pay the uh, extra price and, and work with the dry uh, table sugars. Um, in the wintertime, again, the, the sucrose or the pollen substitute mixed with the, the, the sugar that, like we've already talked about. And which one you use, again, goes back to how much pollen stores or bee bread that you have, that you find in your hives. And again, if there's inadequate protein, the, the bees can't make the royal jelly to feed the queen and the larvae. Uh, keep in mind that pollen is the primary protein source, nectars are the primary sugar source. So use uh, as, a, as a substitute for nectar, you need to use the table sugar, the, the sucrose. There's a lot of other sugars that may be available. Uh, I would stay away from those because many of them are toxic to, to bees. You need to have some fats that you would normally find in pollens, and those are used by the bees to make the pheromones and the sex hormones. Uh, and then keep in mind that wax is made from sucrose. So if you want to, to if you need more, if the, the bees need to make wax, uh, especially with new colonies, or uh, if you harvest the wax and, and the bees need, need to make new wax, you need to feed them heavy with uh, sucrose, with the syrup. Hopefully this is what your bee colony is gonna look like um, mid to late summer. Uh, make sure that you're treating for varroa mites before the winter, right after your summer harvest. Because again, you want as healthy a colony and as strong a colony as you can going into the winter. Um, one of the things that I always talk about is the, the pollen sources. And ideally, um, close to your apiary, uh, you have some area that uh, you can plant a variety of plants. Uh, what you need to have is plants, a variety of plants where some plants are in bloom all growing season long because the, it's just like us. We eat every day. Uh, we eat a variety of foods every day. The bees need that same variety of, of foods because no one uh, plant nectar source is uh, adequate to meet the bees' needs. Uh, so there's all kinds of, of, you know, the weather conditions, soil conditions, fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, other factors. Uh, I hope that you guys have something like, uh, or, or something where you can register the location of your hive. So pesticide, herbicide applicators can notify you ahead of time. Uh, we do in most areas in the States, uh, that helps. And also keep in mind that insecticides with fungicides as that combination, uh, that tends to be a lot more deadly to bees than uh, those two compounds separately. And then you need about five, again, five to six frames of pollen going into the winter months. Uh, feed that four to 5% protein. That is one part pollen supplement or pollen substitute to nine parts of uh, sucrose. Uh, if you don't have, uh, well, when they can't make cleansing flights, but if you, if you don't have that four to you know, five to six frames of pollen going into the winter months, uh, as long feed the, the higher protein, as long as the bees can make cleansing flights, 
And again, as soon as they, it, the temperature is such that they cannot make cleansing flights anymore, drop that protein level. And if they got adequate uh, pollen stores, adequate bee bread, uh, you can do without the, the uh, protein at all for the winter feeding until the queen starts laying, and then you need to have the, the protein in there. Now, also keep in mind, I, don't, I doubt that you guys have um, small high beetles up there yet, uh, but keep in mind that uh, these pollen protein sources um, are great for the bees. They're also great for uh, small high beetles and other insects that will attack the, the hives. Uh, if you get wax moths, it's, it's, you've got a dead hive anyway. But uh, I don't think it's going to be uh, a real big deal for the, the mites. I don't think that they can use that. They're more uh, carnivorous than they are uh, omnivorous or even uh, uh, herbivores. Uh, so I, I don't think it's going to have a big impact on the, the mites. Other than to say that if you load up and, and the general recommendation that I would make is that go ahead and, and load up the, the protein in the fall uh, and get those bees in good conditions. Granted that that's going to increase the protein in their fat bodies, and that's exactly where the uh, varroa mites are going to attack. So it, it does increase susceptibility slightly to the mites, uh, improves their the mite growing conditions, so that's, again, why it's so important to uh, treat for mites in the fall before uh, the winter sets in. So again, if you've got adequate pollen stores in the, in the hive, uh, you could go to straight sugar. And, and again, I, I think that I would recommend the, the uh, Ziploc bags, the, the Krabby Patties. That seems to me to work a lot better as far as the bees not having to break a cluster than uh, using sugar boards. And again, even in the middle of the winter, I wear a bee suit because, uh, again, I've been a, a stung every month of the year. I, I don't think you can see it, but uh, there's my German shepherd right down here beside me. He, my German shepherd would go out with me and every time to, to uh, take care of the bees. My lab would not. He had short hair and the, the bees got to him. He'd stay away from the hives. But my German shepherd had long enough hair that he would go out with me. And the only time he would take off is uh, if the bees were getting around his face. Which, otherwise he was right there beside me. And when we talk about uh, a variety of pollen sources, this is, was taken in central Iowa, but this is an, an ideal summer forage situation. This is some acres that uh, one of the farmers in that area set aside just for pollinators. And there's about uh, almost 10 acres here. And that's, uh, and I, some of the comments I've had when I teach the master bee, the nutrition section of the master beekeeper course is that uh, the beekeepers notice a significant improvement in uh, honey production and in winter survival after they have uh, spent time looking at and developing uh, foraging sites for their honeybees. So this is, this is a big part of it because a lot of the, the reason for winter losses is the loss of forage. So that's, that's kind of where I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I guess I will move to questions at this point, but I really wanted to emphasize uh, the things that, that will help with winter survival. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up to questions, Bryce. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dale. Very informative, a lot of information there. Um, now I'm gonna open it up to questions uh, from any of the members. Uh, just getting back to the uh, quilt box, uh, sir. How many holes did you have in that? Just the two? And two. what's diameter? I, I, did, I did one inch holes, two on each side, but the ends were closed. So there's, there's four holes. Okay, thank you. I have a question. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Um, my bees pack their pollen into the lower uh, brood box, so it's pretty much below. Do you recommend moving frames up for the winter or just leave them packed with the sugar, the honey, 
uh, closer to the brood box. I, I, I think that you could leave them in, in the lower uh, brood box because uh, they're going to, when they kick up that temperature, when the queen starts laying, they're going to spread out inside that, that, uh, that hive box so they can get to it then. The, the main concern is when they uh, are in the cluster and, and that is when they're only moving up. Does that answer your question or, or uh, I'm, no? I'm kind of got a bad internet connection, so I won't drag it on, but uh, thank you. I, yeah, they seem to do okay with uh, pollen down in the bottom. And yes, when it's warmer, they probably break cluster and move to the pollen. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Anybody else? It's your opportunity to ask questions now. The, the pollen uh, substitute that you use, uh, do you make it yourself or is there any particular you would recommend for winter? Well, I'm, I'm going to give you a very biased answer and I use the AP23 because I developed it and I know what's in it. Um, I'm not, I don't know whether the AP23 from the Dant is available in Canada. I've pushed him to do that. I don't know whether they've actually done that or not. But uh, as far as the pollen substitutes, uh, one of the things I don't like is some of the grains that, it, that some of them are based on uh, because the, the, uh, that's a high starch content and the bees can't do very well on starch. Uh, I also don't like soy flour, which is, is typically used in some of the lower cost ones. Uh, the soy flour has a lot of indigestible sugars in it uh, that increase the, um, let's call it diarrhea, or if, if they can't make cleansing flights, uh, increases susceptibility to nosema. Uh, so I stay away from, now, I stay away from soy flour products, but if it's soy concentrate or if it's soy protein isolate, most of those sugars, if not all of those sugars have been removed. So that's a different story. It's the soy flour that I don't like and, and many of the grains that are, are commonly used. Thank you. So most of them, are actually several of them, if, if they're based on yeast and soy concentrate or soy protein concentrate or soy protein isolate was, is even better. Uh, but keep in mind that as you go to those more refined protein sources, the price is going to increase as well. But I think from the bee standpoint, uh, you're further ahead. You, you get more for your money from the, from the bees if you uh, uh, stay away from the grains and stay away from the soy flour. Uh, a, a question from Ian. Can go you ahead, Ian. Yeah, no. go ahead. Uh, I don't want to talk about mm, a name brand product, but I'm talking about Super DMF Honeybee. Um, it's the microbial um, additive. Um, could you talk in general terms whether these additives <laughs> are effective or a waste of money? Yes. Okay, my position on that is, one is that there may be some benefit under high stress situations, but the, the rate of passage, that is from the time that the bee ingests a food item until it goes from, from the mouth to excretion out the anus is usually about two and a half hours. Most of these bacteria the generation time is about eight hours, eight to 10 hours. So are they being, are, is that bacteria being used as a protein source or is it actually, are they far enough along when they're, when they're ingested that they actually reproduce and, and provide some benefit to the bee? The other challenge, big challenge is that most of the bacteria products on the market are, 
are uh, based on what we find in livestock and in humans. And that's not the same ones that are found in the bee digestive tract. All right. So my recommendation is if you're going to use them, use them under high stress situations. And you may want to work with Gary on, on record keeping because he's been through that part of the Master Beekeeper course and try to determine whether there's an economic benefit to you and to the bees when you do that. But across the board, uh, they're probably not going to be very cost effective. Uh, will they be detrimental to the hive? I doubt that they would be detrimental. But there, that is, it will be an additional cost to the beekeeper. And I'm not sure that it's, I'm not totally convinced that, that under most situations that you're going to have an economic benefit. Great. Thank you. But, but the only way you're going to determine that is to keep records in your apiary and under your production conditions to see if, it, if there is a benefit. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ian. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, Michael has one here. Okay. In regards to your Ziploc baggies that you make, you know, different percentage of pollen to sucrose, is it just straight sucrose you more or less use, or do you do any kind of additive more like kind of what Ian was talking about or in essential oils or anything like that, or just straight sucrose? Okay. I will typically, when I talk about the let's say the, the four parts uh, protein powder to six parts of sucrose. What I, and enough water to make that into kind of a uh, uh, peanut butter consistency. And usually when I do that, I will add in a, in a four and a half pound batch, five pound batch, I will add a tablespoon of white vinegar and a tablespoon of uh, honey be healthy and about, uh, oh, probably half a teaspoon of salt. And the reason that I add the uh, uh, honey bee healthy and the uh, vinegar is strictly uh, for palatability purposes to try and increase food intake. I don't think that the essential amino or the, the essential oils in there the, in, in Honey Bee Healthy, the, and it's uh, spearmint and the uh, lemongrass oil, I don't think are going to, there, there's not enough in there to really have much of a health effect, if there is any at all. I think it's, they're more for palatability. And the same with the vinegar, the, that, that tablespoon in that four and a half pounds, uh, some people have asked me if that's for uh, preservation, and th that's not really enough acetic acid to, to, to act as a preservative. It's going to act as a palatability enhancer because that is the same, uh, this, the acetic acid in the vinegar is the same acid that is produced during the fermentation of the pollen to make the bee bread. Perfect. Thank you for answering that question. Uh, just to follow up with that one now, when you do add the salt, it's the sea salt and not uh, I, table salt, right? Uh, I use just table salt, even though it's iodized. Uh, I don't think that that's a problem because we're not using that much of it. The, the challenge is you want to make sure that uh, it is as small a grain as you can get um, because the, you know, the rest of that food is going to be pollen size. And some of the sea salt is a much bigger crystal. So the bees may or may not be able to, to uh, adequately use that in a reasonable amount of time. Perfect. Thank you. I didn't know that. Uh, I would have gone with kosher salt, but that will be way too big. Yeah, but that, that would be fine if you can crush that salt down to a very fine powder before you put it in there. Okay, thank you. That's, that's the big secret is, is particle size. You want that just as small as you can get it. Okay. Thank anybody, you. Anybody have any? Thanks, Mikhail. Um, anybody have any other questions before we let Dale go for the evening? I want to make sure that we cover off any questions anybody has. Last chance. 
All right. Okay. I'm going to call on Ian now, if I could, just to thank our speaker. Um, so Ian, if you want to unmute. Oh, you're muted still, Ian. There you go. There you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dale, for um, agreeing to present to our Kamloops Beekeepers uh, Club. I enjoyed your presentation. I I'm particularly interested in the Krabby bo uh, bags, boxes, and the information on the uh, quilt box and the high fructose corn syrup. Um, you, you, you shared a wealth of information and uh, I wish to thank you on behalf of the Kamloops Beekeepers Club. Thank you, Dr. Hill. And if you have, you know, after the, the meeting, if you have additional questions, uh, I think uh, Gary has my email address and he can get a hold of me if, if necessary, if need be. Be happy to answer your questions for you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Dale. Okay. Um, we'll let you sign off and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you again for taking the time to uh, join us this evening and share your wealth of knowledge. We very You're much appreciate welcome. it. All Thank right. you. Thank you and good night. Good night. Good night. Okay, I am going to All right, can everybody see the agenda again? All right, I believe it's up there for everybody. Yes. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to uh, cover off a couple of things. I think, Lawrence, are you still on? I know you had to try and get offline uh, promptly at, before seven. Are you still there, Lawrence? Yeah, no one's getting in. Yeah, I'm here. Do you wanna go ahead? Do you wanna go yeah, ahead and do I'm your cover? Basically, I, yeah, I have nothing new to report for governance. There's been nothing on my end, so. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I just didn't want to hold you up and delay you as well, Lawrence. So thank you for that. All right, uh, we'll head back to the main agenda again. Just an update on process uh, for attendance or uh, being able to get items on the agenda to the board of directors. Um, as you know, we meet as a, uh, a general uh, meeting every second month. The same is happening with the uh, board of directors. Um, I've had some people ask and weren't sure about the process. The process to get things on the agenda or before your uh, board is just uh, simply contacting any one of them prior to the meeting. We meet the exact same uh, Tuesday of the month, uh, all just alternating months. Uh, make sure that you get in touch with myself or certainly any one of the directors um, and uh, let us know what agenda item it is that you'd like to have added for discussion. Um, at that point, uh, we'll make sure that you're available to um, join in by a link to the Zoom. Uh, currently, that's the way we're meeting. Um, and I would expect we will be for a period of time yet to be. Um, but that's the process. So any questions on how that takes place? Because there was a couple of people asking, and it's pretty straightforward. But again, I want to make sure everybody's comfortable with it. Uh, Bryce, I had a couple people ask me if the... Uh about that, the, about the meetings. And because they said at first, you said it was going to be open for everybody to listen. It, people can if they want, but again, remembering that there is limitations on the Zoom. So we need to be able to make sure we get them the Zoom link, Murray. Okay. Um, without without them contacting us, I, I don't know who to send it. And we don't want to be sending it out to um, everybody if it's not needed, right? It's just another filler in the inbox. So um, we're more than happy to ha have anybody attend um, and you're there in observation role. If you have something on the agenda, you'll be able to speak to that agenda item. And, uh, and then again, um, it's the business of the organization that's going on on that alternating. So we're just trying to make sure that it stays as efficient as well. But I agree, Murray, not a problem. Happy to do so. Just uh, send us what it is that you're interested in. We'll make sure you get the Zoom link. And uh, the Zoom link, just to just let everyone know, it's been staying the same. 
Yeah. So it's it's always the same link. So just click on it again for the next meeting, and anyone can join. Yeah. It was a little tough getting on tonight. I went on the the website, and I just I couldn't just click click and get on it. I had to go and find it where I had it saved before in a, in an email. Okay, so on the website, the link itself on the KBC website. Yeah, it wasn't highlighted, and I, I couldn't get on that way. Okay, I'll have a quick peek. Okay, the hyperlink may have, uh, you know, disappeared off it or something, but that's an easy one. But thanks for the heads up on that. We can get that adjusted. So uh, thanks for that. Okay, yeah, anything? I added it today as well to the Facebook uh, event. So the link was right. actually in the Facebook event as well. So, okay. Excellent. Okay. Is that, uh, is everybody comfortable with that before we move on to the next item? I just wanted to make sure that got covered. Not seeing anybody else. I'm trying to scan the group. So my apologies it does take a minute to do that, but, uh, screen sharing doesn't allow me a very big, uh, surface area to see everybody. So, um, all right, so discussion on returning to face-to-face. -to -face. Uh, we were hoping that this was gonna be our first face-to-face. -face. Uh, we had a location back at the university again. Um, they were ready to host us. I contacted Kimberly uh, Johnson again and just let her know that because of the fourth wave of COVID that we've had to pull back. Um, and I think based on where we're at, unless something changes um, in the next uh, month here, um, I think we're probably going to be having to stay with a virtual meeting for a period of time because they're talking there's potentially a fifth wave that could hit as well. Um, we certainly don't want to put anybody in harm's way. The other thing that we have to deal with is obviously vaccine passports. Um, so um, that will be required um, for people coming in because of the um, openness of the meeting. So uh, we'll have to follow the provincial health orders. So uh, PHO will rule on that. It's the same thing as happening in uh, other organizations I'm involved in. It's exactly the same way. Um, so we have to uh, follow those rules. So um, I would love to get to a face-to-face -face and uh, certainly hope that happens sooner rather than later. But I think at this point, we are uh, going to be continuing to do virtual meetings. So comments from anybody? Not seeing any. All right. Um, again, just a uh, friendly reminder, the uh, BCHPA AGM conference and trade show, free to members. Uh, there is a charge for non-members coming up on the 29th and 30th. Um, it is running 8.30 to 3.30 was what it was posted on their website. Um, but that, in fact, now there was an update that it's actually going to run until about 1230. So I think they've shortened it to four hour blocks. I think they found that doing a morning and an afternoon was uh, quite substantial um, for people to be able to commit to. Um, but uh, there was a notice that came out and updated on the timing on it. But the dates are the 29th and 30th. So I would recommend having a good look at it. It looks like uh, they're going to be bringing in a pretty good, strong group of uh, speakers so encourage people to have a good look at it uh, it's free to you as a member might as well take advantage of it some excellent speakers um, and a great opportunity to uh, gain a wealth of knowledge so uh, have a look at it uh, moving on to action items Lawrence you've already done your presentation uh, Mikhail technology any updates on uh, I know you've got a ton of things you're trying to get done but uh, go ahead floor is yours there, mute, unmute. Yeah, um, I do have a lot of things on the go and unfortunately time hasn't you know, been on my side, but the newsletter sign up is up and running. So we are getting, it's a few there, it's not very many right now, uh, but it's working. And I also connected that one to the, from the Facebook page so people can sign up through the Facebook page. So. We have a handful of people there already, so that's going. Uh, I do have the Queen Rearing calendar copied over to the um, KBC website, but I'm still just styling it a little bit before I let people poke around at it and check it out. And I think that's 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 it from me. Okay, excellent. Any questions on technology from uh, members? 
I, I think that was kind of hit in the email. I didn't, I, I missed, I had to look two, three times to find um, in the email where it said to sign up for the, uh, for the emails, for the newsletters. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, you know, go ahead, Mikhail. No, I, I, yeah, I totally agree with Murray there in the sense that we really want to push that, make it very noticeable. Uh, so we can get more conversion on that because uh, right now it's just hidden. But that's, I did have some issues connecting that because it's connected through with MailChimp. So there was some issues with that. So, but now it seems to have resolved itself. So I think we can just go ahead and really push that. Maybe just a um, short sweep. Rob here. Go ahead, Rob. Sorry, Rob, can't hear you. Uh, I have I have freezing issues. It's just yeah, a, you're on now. videos on and off. Anyway, but I'd like to get uh, Michael to tell us on which page uh, that um, uh, email sign up is posted on the website. Under what page would uh, people go to access that? It will be kamloopsbeekeepers.com slash newsletter. Newsletter. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay. And, Thank and you. otherwise, Thank if they're on Facebook, you know, you have that bar on Facebook at the, the Kamloops uh, KBC Facebook page. Uh, there is, you know, photos and, you know, some options there. There's also email sign up. Maybe just a quick email to, to the members just with just that, not a whole lot of short and sweet. Yeah, I, I, and I would agree with that, Marie. Um, the newsletter came out with a lot of information. Rob really needed to do a tremendous amount of information drop all at once. And uh, we'll try and uh, do it a little more frequently with some small stabs of information so that uh, it's less cluttered. So uh, good point, and we'll clean that up a little bit. Thanks. Just to comment, uh, the purpose of the newsletter and the email sign up, our, uh, when our members join, their um, permission is there on the, on the membership form. So that's a given. Uh, what the purpose of the email permission is, is for non-members, people who want to follow our site and receive those emails. So uh, yes, it can go to our members, which is kind of redundant, but yes, having it available to the wider audience and that allows uh, MailChimp access later on. Right, which is what we're trying to achieve. So, and I see that uh, Mikhail has also put that link in the chat bar. So if you have a look there, you'll be able to pick it up there. Good. All right, so thanks for that, appreciate it. Thanks, Murray, thanks, Rob, thanks, Mikhail. Um, anybody have anything else they want to ask uh, under technology before we move on to board development with Gary? Looking, not seeing any hands up or anything. So I'm going to move on. Uh, board development, Gary Martin, please. Okay, only one thing. It's kind of a big thing. Thank you, Bryce, for finding us a new secretary. You're welcome. So, Tanisha and Yes, we. Ha I have not met her, so it's hard to introduce someone I haven't met. She was. She Just, was actually. Uh, she was at our field day, so she was at our field yes. day. Yes. So you met her there, but not, not oh, directly. Okay. Yeah. That's when you tackled her. Okay. I good. did. Yeah, she was there, <laughs> and I. I said, "Hey, what do you think?" <laughs> okay, that works. That works. <laughs> so I. I guess the. Question to Rob and Tanisha is what would you want from me to try and facilitate you to working together? Uh, from, from you directly. Hi, by the way. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I basically, I, I, what do you mean? Do you need, what do we need from you to help us work together better for the transitions yeah, yeah. that you're asking? Yeah, that's it. If, if you ever get frustrated with something and say oh, something's not working out, just let me know and I'll see what I can do to help that. Okay, that sounds great. My, as I said, my computer is freezing intermittently, so I wasn't able to follow Tanisha, but uh, we can stay in touch and discuss exchanges. But Gary, what I'd really like is an extra week or two, you know, just can you create a new month for me? Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I think we're all feeling a little bit of that. It's like, holy smokes. Uh, it's a question, Bryce. Yes. Uh, are we getting ahead of ourselves here? Have we had an election for Tanisha? No, we haven't, but it's an appointment that's going forward um, to for a replacement. She needs to be duly elected. At this point, the uh, piece that we're doing is we're actually uh, just doing a little bit of mentoring um, and yeah. transitioning, and then she will be posted to run for that position, and uh, it has to be duly elected. Thank you, Bryce. That's no problem. Hard. That's a point of clarity. I appreciate that, but again, uh, Rob wanting that transitional period, we've... Uh, and it, we've brought her in, created a, um, a email site for her so that uh, she's in the loop. That will obviously transfer to secretary when she's fully and duly elected. But uh, working with uh, board development and the rest of the team, that's where we sit currently. My comment was only because of procedure. Right. Uh, if, if Tanisha is elected as our secretary, she will do a 100% fine job. There you go. Look at another another voice of endorsement. There yeah. you go, Tanisha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that's great. So thank you for uh, the update, Gary. And uh, Tanisha, we look forward to seeing how it all rolls out and look forward to having you duly elected in the at the AGM uh, coming up in the uh, end of the year. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, and I look forward to working alongside and for all of you guys. So, thank you. It's awesome. Thank you. And thank you for agreeing. So, uh, events. Um, I do not believe Nancy is on tonight. I did not see her. I know she's usually just by phone because of her Wi Fi, uh, but I don't see her name on the attendees tonight. And I did not receive an email from her. Anybody, uh, Mikhail or any of the other directors, uh, get any correspondence from Nancy? No. Seeing head shakes, so I'm assuming not on that front. Um, and uh, so moving along to fundraising, Joanne, are you online tonight? But I saw her earlier. I did. I did too, but I'm yeah. not seeing her she's on now. now. Yeah, so it looks as though she's had to drop off. So not sure what happened there. Anyways, if she pops back on, we'll get an update. I um, saw Jenna. I didn't see uh, Joanne. Oh, you know what? You're right. I think it was Jenna. Yeah. So I don't think it was Joanne now that you mentioned that. Good point. Anyways, I have not heard from her, so I'll have to follow up. I'll make a call to her and just see if everything is okay and uh, if there was anything um, to add. So, uh, Next uh, committee is education. Ian, any updates? Um, great job on tonight's speaker uh, between you and Gary. That was great. Uh, appreciate that. Thank you. I enjoyed uh, the presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I guess I'm always asking for suggestions for the next uh, meeting. You've got to let me know what you'd like to hear about. I've, uh, I'm thanking Gary for suggesting Dale Hill and uh, I, I need those kind of suggestions so that we can keep moving uh, forward. Yeah, that's great. Um, I think, uh, you know, the nice thing with all of this is, is that the virtual meetings, and I think we'll probably stay in some form of a hybrid meeting going forward as well, Ian, as we've talked about, I think it opens the door to a lot of other people, right? It does. It opens the door to a lot of people that we could not afford to, to have come to Kamloops, and they wouldn't be interested in, in coming this far for a small honorarium. Um, so we're, we're very fortunate. One of my small concerns is we only have 21 people on right now. I didn't keep a record as we went through the meeting, but we've been up into the 30, 35 range. We've had a hundred or 75 at the TRU. We need to work on getting back up to that number on this kind of a, 
Zoom meeting. I know it's difficult. It's six o'clock. People are busy, but um, if anyone has suggestions on how to increase our attendance at these Zoom meetings until we can get back together in person, then I think all those suggestions are valuable. I think you just need more reminders to people. A lot of people forget. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. And, and the thing is, yeah, I, I posted today uh, in other groups just to remind people of it, but I wish I could have done that a few days earlier. Just, just very, very busy. And, uh, but yeah, no, I agree with that. Definitely. And yeah, then, uh, the thing is, I'm also worried, like if I, if I put it in a group that we might get a lot of people coming, then we want to make sure that our paying members having the first, you know, they are actually can see the presentation. Yeah, now, yeah. The, these, the, the good thing with these student presentations is they are recorded. So they can always look at it afterwards. So how do we do that, Mikhail? So I have posted the videos on our website uh, in the events there. And yeah. then we also have a YouTube channel. So they're yeah. normally posted there as well. So that okay. will be one thing we have to communicate to those URLs. There. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Our, right? our B inspector, Diane Dunaway, um, wasn't able to attend tonight, but she would like that information about uh, video. Uh, she would like to have been here, but had another uh, family issue. So, okay, that's good to know that it's available. Okay, and I'd like to recognize Marg now. She set her hand up, so I just want to recognize Mar Marg. Go ahead, unmute yourself. Can't Did you hear Marg? No, can't hear her. She's not unmuted. She's not unmuted yet, uh, Joe. I think Marg's on there twice. Okay. So I don't know what's yeah. going on. That Marg Loman is on twice. So maybe yeah, it's a one mistake. is one is Joe and the other one is her though. <clears throat> not working, Mark. Would it be possible to change the time of the meeting to seven o'clock rather than six? because a lot of people are still having dinner or just finishing up at six o'clock and the, you know, it pushes things. We can, we can take that uh, into consideration. Absolutely. I think it's, you. It, uh, yeah. you know, cause I think it's like everything else uh, there. Uh, we went through it before and there was a number <laughs> of people that said trying to end it earlier too. Right. So I think that's kind of where that comes from. Okay. Just a suggestion. Yeah, no, it's valid, and I and we'll uh, we'll put it on the agenda for the board meeting. And we'll have some discussion about it. Thank you. No problem. Oh, membership fees. Membership fees. Okay, there's a seconder on that uh, with Joe's suggestion. That's from Krista in the chat. Um, Rosemary as well. So there's a few people in the chat line uh, echoing that similar kind of thing for a little bit later start. So let's have a look at that. Uh, we'll, we'll put that on the agenda and uh, give it uh, some consideration because we certainly want attendance. That's the, the key thing. We want to make it work for people. I think the bigger thing is, you know, whether or not it's virtual or in person too. So uh, we're going to be virtual for a while here, I think. Okay. Um, so just to uh, close off on Ian, I think that's the uh, biggest thing. Get some information to Ian, stay in touch with him. If there's a specific topic that you would like to see or you know somebody that would be a great uh, presenter under our education forum, please uh, reach out, let us know, and uh, we'll have a look and a, get a contact. We'll follow up and see if we can't get him to come and speak. We've had some great speakers, so uh, I want to say a huge thanks. It's been great. Uh, Bryce, I just heard someone mention membership fees. Did anyone else hear that or, or it, is it not an issue? It was Mark that said that. Okay. Mark, I think you're yes. unmuted. Was, was there might... something else? 
You're unmuted when, now. When are membership dues due in November? They'll be at the end of the year. Our actual year end is actually the end of December. Um, December. That coincides with, uh, because it's all through uh, BCHPA, right? So their, <laughs> their fiscal year and their calendar year are identical. Um, so I did check with the provincial office on it, and it is the end of the year. So they will start collecting dues earlier, um, and it'll carry on into January, February, obviously, for some people. Um, but it is due by the end of December. Thank you. Okay. Dave, comment there? Well, just to reiterate, there is no local dues right. for next year. So, Right. It's just, just the... The base fees for the uh, uh, BCHPA, and you just, if you would be good enough to just click through that uh, you're part of the Camelops branch, uh, then the uh, uh, connection to the Camelops branch goes through because we are a branch of. So that's how that all works. But there's no additional fee on the local level anymore as of this year. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Um, communications. Christine, you've been patiently waiting there. Let me just unmute myself here. You're on. Um, I've been relatively, uh, my apologies for missing last meeting, and even this last month, I've been relatively inactive just due to holidays and it's canning season and bees and everything. So I've been, and you know, just trying to get stuff out for this meeting. I, like I said, I haven't really, really been too active with the things, right? But uh, appreciate these meetings because even coming out of this, it's like, okay, you have a lot of dates, you have a lot of things where it's easy just to kind of generate a lot of content, right? Little reminders, certain times of years, a lot of kind of um, post-dated kind of, kind of stuff that I can put up and it'll just kind of come through as the timing pops up. Um, the last meeting, there was some questions about kind of the communication and how that was going I did try to reach out to members through via email but I didn't hear back from anyone so that's kind of where that is at so of course anyone at this meeting that you know if there are concerns with communications or anything like that feel free to email me directly my you know email for communications for the Camelot Beekeeper is on the web page right so it's kind of hard some ways where yeah, so nonetheless, I, I definitely it's something if you do have concerns or anything like that, please do bring that to my attention so that we can bring it up at board meetings or make sure that that's addressed. It's a bit of a transition phase right now where we are kind of moving from like once again to the from the old email list to MailChimps. We want to make sure we have all the valid permissions from people because of anti-spamming laws. And so we're in this kind of limbo area where, of course, we want to increase attendance. We want to make sure we reach out to membership. We want to make sure we reach out to the community and grow that kind of body, but it is going to take a little bit of time. And so I'm really happy with the team with, you know, Mikel has been great. Um, and Ian really good. Um, in this, and we're going to see that better. growing winter and really coming out strong in the spring. So that's where that's at. Like I said, if anyone have any concerns with communication or anything that they want to see, we want to, of course, meet our membership's needs. So like I said, reach out and email. So yeah, that's, that's my update. Okay. Thanks very much. Any comments from anyone with communication for Christine to give her any guidance? Not seeing any hands popping up. I just have one thing to ask. So for communications, um, being the BCHPA rep, I send things out and they don't seem to get out to emails. Um, should I be sending them to Christine then instead of, I have, I don't have her on my list. Uh, yeah, like I, I sent out some stuff for the WAS and it didn't get put out. And a lot of it is time sensitive because they send out like two weeks before and you have to sign up and it gets full. So there's, there's some pretty good things out there as well. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I think. Uh, go ahead. Sorry, Murray. I, I think you probably still sent to the secretary because that's the main uh, getting out in the email, uh, but also to Christine to the communication because she'll do the Facebook and all that. And okay, well, the, the, last, the, too. the last few haven't got emailed out. So and a lot of people don't have Facebook. 
Like I know a lot of people, don't, older people don't have Facebook. They're not interested. So mm -hmm. I just wondered why it's not getting out or who do I have to get it to? Yeah. Who have you been sending it to, Murray? Just the secretary I've, at this point? I've sent it to the board of directors. I sent it to all you guys. I don't, I haven't been getting it like that. No. I, I haven't, I haven't got it because every one of us would be getting it. If it was going to BOD, it would be going to all of us on the, uh, on the board. And I, I have not seen them. So I'm not sure what's going on there, Murray. I, I know I saw one from her there and that was, uh, that was probably a month and a half ago. And I remember that was the Vault Loss Conference. And there was another one just a couple weeks ago. Hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll check and see my... Unless it's rerouted somewhere else. I don't know, but it's, I have sent it out to everybody. That, that's interesting. We're going to have to follow up on that, Murray, because definitely I know I have not seen those or... Um, you know, and that's probably why there's there's a communication link there somewhere that's not working. Well, may, so we're, maybe we're tomorrow I'll, I'll send a I'll send a test out. Yeah, and just please. somebody somebody reply to me. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll expect it. Yeah, okay, we'll watch for it. That's yep, great. Thanks. thanks, Murray. Appreciate that. Okay. All right. So that uh, communication is always the biggest nemesis. It's a nightmare. So uh, let's see if we can't tighten that up. Um, next item is our uh, treasurer's report. Dave, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, we're in great shape. We haven't spent any money. We got our rebate check from the BCHBA for $680. But as a side, we should know that they have the Irene uses a time limit on when to Who's eligible for the rebate? Returning members are eligible for a rebate to us if they sign up before January 31st. Mm. Anybody that is a new beekeeper, new to the BCHPA that has Kamloops as a, uh, a group is eligible up until the end of July. For a rebate mm. so there was i think there was eight people that we didn't get a rebate from that had joined the bchpa so we should encourage people to pay their bchpa dues before january 31st okay well add that into the communique for sure okay otherwise we have over fifteen thousand dollars now so in the bank All account right. So start it, spending some money. Well, we're, we're trying to do education things. We want to be prudent. We want to be making sure that it's effective spend. Yeah. So other, otherwise, boy, we could spend it. Well, <laughs> politically incorrect. Uh, you've got to have that female attitude. It's just money. Come yeah. On. yeah. <laughs> Careful now. That's I know, not PC. I know. I'm sorry. That's, that's PC. Yeah. <laughs> I apologized ahead of time. You did. Ready. You did. Okay. That's it. I think we're in good okay. shape. And, okay. Any uh, any questions of the treasurer? No, not seeing anything. I'm scanning the the, one bingo, the Zoom board here. Perhaps one last thing okay, is Dave. if the committee members have uh, future expenditures that they foresee for next year, perhaps they could. Uh, send me an email and I'll try and build them into a budget for 2022. Excellent. Okay. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll add that onto the agenda as well so that the uh, committees all submit if they think they're going to need anything. Okay. Just oh, and, and there was two people that should get a, a thank you. And it was uh, Gary Martin and Bruce Florence for their donation to the cause. Of twenty dollars each. Oh, nice. Well, thanks for that. That's fantastic. And donations are well and appreciated. Okay. All right. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Dave. Good job on keeping the books current and uh, everything paid, and uh, we appreciate that. It and we haven't had a lot of stuff going on, but what has been there has been processed. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, regional report. 
Uh, Murray, I'm, I'm not sure if you've got anything because I, I understand you weren't able to do the last meeting, but uh, did you have uh, some information on it? Uh, yeah, I got most some of the last meeting in the meeting before, so okay. I, do I do have some really exciting news, but I'm going to save it to the last thing I'm going to tell you about. Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. it is exciting. Um, the BCHPA has 770 members right now. Um, there is also, if anybody lost any hives, um, the, the government has a wildfire and drought apiary recovery program. So if anybody has lost any hives or any thing in the agricultural section, section, there is help for them. Um, the other thing is, like you already mentioned, is the BCHPA AGM. I don't know if you can see that, but if you go to the... No, it's blocking out because of your background. Sorry, Marie. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, anyway, just go to the BCHPA website and uh, just look it up there. And like Bryce said, it is two days. The first day can be boring unless you really like numbers because it's usually the business day. Um, but the next, the, the second day is usually the, the better day for most people. Uh, there is also, I'm just supposed to be getting some boxes uh, from True Honey Buzz. Um, it's the guy down at the coast that has that, I think it's is it an MRI machine or something like that or whatever it is. And what he does is he does honey sampling because of all the adulterated honey. So he's pushing to get more samples in. So right now is the time because he, he likes honey and he also likes honey a little bit in the honeycomb so he can get a reading of the wax and the honey in the area. So I will be getting some more little boxes and um, when I do get them, I'll put it out there. So if anybody wants to participate, it just comes, you just put it in a box, it's a little kit, and mail it back to them and, and everything is good. Uh, the, so the really exciting news is the tech transfer program um, some of the older beekeepers will know what it is and heard of it before. It's been talked about a lot at the AGMs. So it's basically just problem solving and it's for it's, uh, all beekeepers. It's for commercial beekeepers, but it's also for all beekeepers. And so they were looking for somebody and they put it out there and they found somebody. And it's a lady by the name of Ali McAfee. Once again, some of the older beekeepers will know her and have seen her at, uh, at different um, AGMs. But the real exciting part is She's from Ontario, but she's moving to BC, and um, it looks like Kamloops might be her home. Oh. So that'll be really exciting. I don't know if there's something else going on, why she wants to be here, but that's the latest news. So it'll be really interesting and, and fun to have her here that, that close to our club. That'd be great. That is good news. Great, yeah, great to is. hear about that, Marie. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any, any comments or questions uh, regarding provincial as our uh, regional rep uh, representative. There was a message there in the chat there from Krista Williams. She said oh. that, do, do, we, do we get the report when we send our samples in? I sent my sample in about a month ago. The report meaning breakdown of what is, is in our honey. Um, I think if you want it, you can ask for it. But right now they're probably really busy just inputting information. Um, it's more for them for a data bank to have so if there is any problems down the road, they, they can find where it come from. But I'm pretty sure you can find, um, I'll, I'll check with them again tomorrow. Uh, you can, they'll, they'll tell you how much pollen's in your honey and what's in it. And yeah, that is available. But like I said, they're probably just really busy right now. Uh, just, just a comment. I've sent some in in the past and I used their app on your phone. And it took a while, but it, you do get it back, the report. Yeah, he's just hired somebody down there. I think his name is Peter, right? He just hired someone to kind of uh, um, run things a little more because he, he's a pretty busy beekeeper and stuff, so. Excellent. Okay, thanks very much, Murray. Appreciate that update. Um, just uh, moving on to uh, the next item on our agenda, just to gain a reminder of the affiliation with the Kamloops branch, uh, make sure your contact info is current. One of the things that uh, Dave uh, didn't mention and didn't mention uh, uh, when he was doing the membership was that there is still a few people that don't have email addresses on their applications. Gives us um, you know, a bit of a challenge to try and reach out. Um, I think most people have email addresses. I realize there's some that don't. 
So uh, that's not a judgment call in any way, but certainly it makes our life easier when it comes to communique if everybody has got that completed. So if uh, you would take the time just to make sure that your membership information is current and up to date, that would be gratefully appreciated so that we can get communication to you. Uh, just a question in regards to that. If people do not have emails or not part of that communication part, how would they get information? Is that something that we can otherwise offer them to mail the newsletter or you know the news thing? I'm, I have no idea, but trying to be inclusive. I, I think we can. Uh, you know, if we end up with a, a few people that need to have a newsletter uh, mailed, um, you know, the cost to the uh, uh, to the group is going to be very minimal, um, and I think it's something that we should offer. Um, there are some people in remote areas that struggle with bandwidth and all the rest of it. So uh, the snail mail will still get there. That's better than no mail. I think the website still says it's $20 for membership. Uh, on the local level, yeah. It hasn't been pulled off the site yet because of the um, year not being complete, but it is coming down. Mikhail is pulling it. Yeah, I'll pull it this uh, this fall here now. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks, Marie. We're We're pulling that off. Okay. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. Was there something else there, Joe, that I missed? Sorry. Bryce, has yes. anybody aware that uh, the lady that worked with uh, Provincial Aprons has passed away? We heard from Diane. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah, Jack, she, passed away in August. she was a former B inspector. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, that's unfortunate. She she did a, she did a lot of work for beekeepers in BC. She'll be mentioned in the next BC scene. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks thanks for the update on that. Appreciate that, Joe, Marg, and Will, uh, and Murray, and we'll uh, we'll watch for that then. But uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. Okay, uh, just a quick reminder to everybody, uh, times and locations, we're going to be staying virtual at this point. If by some chance we can actually do our, our uh, next general meeting in November in face-to-face uh, -face format, we will pull that off because um, that is going to be our last meeting coming into the end of the year. So we're going to want to try and make sure memberships get pushed, sign-ups for the new year, um, and as much information as possible. Um, we will try to fill that night uh, if possible, um, because obviously we want to have a great turnout for that evening. There's going to be elections, et cetera, that'll take place on the, uh, on the November meeting. So uh, we'll be looking at implementing that for the year end of December, because it'll be a board meeting in December and transition. So uh, reminding everybody of that. So board of directors, 19th of October, next general meeting, 16th of November. Time will be uh, 16th discussed. Of November. Yes. All right, I'm just looking at the chat just to see if there's anything there. There's a couple of Facebook posts and some links that Mikhail has put in. So there's some links there for people to uh, follow on the chat. Um, so at this point, that uh, leads us to the end of our agenda and uh, looking for a motion for adjournment unless somebody had anything they wanted to uh, have a quick discussion about. Just one question, Bryce. Yes, Dave. Historically, we've had our elections in on the November meeting. Is yes. That the plan? Yes, that is the plan. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The plan is that that meeting will have elections, and uh, and we'll be encouraging everybody, obviously, for the membership uh, that'll come up in December. Thanks for the clarity on that. Okay. Anybody have anything else? I'm not seeing any hands up. Scanning the group. I want to thank everybody, and uh, if I can get a motion for adjournment, please. Go, Dave. You're unmuted. You might as well. I so move. Okay, Joe. That's great. We don't even need a seconder for an adjournment, so we're good. That's great. Thank <laughs> well, you thanks. so much. Thanks, Bryce. Thank You're you. very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Well, right. well, yeah. Thank Stay you well, everybody, and we'll we'll chat with you very soon. Take care. Sounds good. Have thanks, good everybody. Right. Bye bye. Thanks, Bryce. You betcha. Thanks, Bryce. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks to all of you.